today on Still Kiwis and Characters in Motorsport, I meet crew chief Daryl Fox from Gore, motorsport legend Steve Millen from Auckland, and catch up with that devil from Tasmania, Marcus Ambrose. Welcome back to another episode of Still Kiwis and Characters in Motorsport. We begin today's show with IndyCar and a look at the role of crew chief, the guy on the front right wheel at every pit stop. HVM Racing have a Kiwi from Gore with this year's Indy 500 Rookie of the Year, Simona Di Silvestra. I asked Daryl Fox about the road from Invercargill to Indianapolis. Daryl Fox, Invercargill to Indianapolis, that's a heck of a journey. Uh, yes, from being born in Invercargill and growing up a little bit there and then moving to Gore, it's 40 miles north, and then uh, now ending up in Indianapolis in probably one of the most premier open wheel series in the world. It's, uh, it's quite a journey. Now you're the crew chief here at HVM Racing. Uh, you're also the shop manager here. That's a lot of responsibility on that job. Yeah, I mean, I organise everything from the from the managers and the engineers down and, and make sure we meet all the time restraints, make sure we get the car built correctly from the engineers, make sure the truck gets loaded and we make it to the racetrack and uh, everything stays in one piece and, and we everything's built correctly on the car more than anything. It is a long journey between Invercargill and Indianapolis. How did you actually get to do that? What have you got to go through to get out of New Zealand and get into this sort of racing? Well, I, I mean, I was a mechanic. I'd done an apprenticeship uh, as a mechanic, just a regular car mechanic in New Zealand. I've always been a racer uh, f from the heart. I'd done some rallying in New Zealand as a co-driver. Uh, and then um, I've always, always wanted to go racing, and I had that opportunity to come over here, and I was just starting at the bottom. I started as what they call over here a gopher. You go for this and you go for that. I started out doing that, driving the, the truck and the trailer across the countryside and then working my way up to being a mechanic. And then once you're a mechanic, you work your way up through the formulas, and once you, and then you become a crew chief and basically running the whole show. So what sort of training does a Kiwi have to get these days in New Zealand? If there's somebody sitting there now saying, I want to do his job, I want to do that, how does he go about it now? The best thing I can say is, is craft your mechanical skills first and then and then get into some smaller formulas that's where I started you got to start out on your formula Fords or even do a little bit of you know club racing yourself and that join it join your local um, club and that that sports car club whatever you have in New Zealand there and you start from there and then you never know who you know to where you can go from there <laughs> At Indianapolis, uh, won Rookie of the Year for the Speedway, great. And then uh, one week later, I mean only six days later, it all turns the opposite way and we have a fire in a car and their and they're fire extinguishers on the, on the track safety failed a little bit for, for 20, 30 seconds, struggled to get out of her car. She just had a couple of burns on her hand, but the car is uh, pretty much done as far as racing. A lot of parts still salvageable on it, but the, basically the mon monocoque she sits in, we probably won't race that again. Yeah, you know, the, the 500, everybody dreams about it. And to be part of the 33 drivers who are, who are taking part of the race, something really special. And, uh, you know, I won Rookie of the Year too, which is uh, you only can win it once when you're at Indy. And uh, to win that with HVM is something pretty special. Texas wasn't the best, uh, you know, for sure. We, we lost the car in it, which, which is pretty bad. But, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think it kind of happened. It could have gone a little bit better for sure, you know, and uh, the fire could have been extinguished a little bit quicker. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. We can learn from it. And uh, for sure, you know, my first crash in the world uh, was pretty big. So I, I hope uh, no more crashes and that it uh, gets smaller and smaller. Now we're here at HVM Racing and your crew chief is a New Zealander, Daryl Fox. Tell me what you think about New Zealanders as crew chiefs. You know, it's, it's the first time I'm actually working with a New Zealander and the uh, uh, first couple of tests, you know, I couldn't quite understand what he was saying, but now, uh, now I'm, uh, I'm hooked. I know how, uh, like, uh, his slang and all that. And it's really nice. You know, he's a, he's a really nice guy and he's uh, really, really talented and all that. So uh, really working hard here. It's, uh, it's nice to be part uh, in the team with him for sure. And the future for you? The future is still in IndyCar and in America? Yeah, I, I like it here. Um, I like IndyCar and I think it's a, uh, it's a great series. It has its ups and downs, like, uh, like I've said the last week with us, but all in all, it's a great series and it's a, a great place to live too.
I've moved right across town now to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the most famous speedway in the world. And right behind me here is the museum. This museum houses one of the most amazing racing car collections in the world. Entrusted to look after that collection is a guy called AJ. Most of the Kiwis in and around the motor racing scene have nicknames, so why AJ? Well, everybody here was Tony, so that's what I was called back in New Zealand in my younger days. And then AJ, people go, there's Tony here and Tony there, so AJ just became common. AJ, we're at possibly the most famous motorsport museum in the world. Just how did you get to be here? Well, I came with a friend, offered me a job back in 1986. So I came over here to work and I ended up working for Tony George, whose family owned the museum, on his uh, Super V cars for the whole season. We had two cars, so that was pretty awesome, really. You always get the impression that the Indy and the American motor racing scene is a sort of a closed shop, but yet here's a Kiwi working on the cars. Yeah, well, when I came here, I came here to work on race cars and ended up, Tony stopped racing at the end of the year, so I ended up going to work for somebody else and then they called me in 2000, 1990 to come back to work in the restoration department here. But you have a motorsport heritage, you have a motorsport history from starting back in New Zealand. Oh, st no, starting back when I got out of high school and went to work and a friend of mine, him and his dad, wanted to build sprint cars so we built two sprint cars in their garage at home and ran them for three years. That was fun. Your job here at the museum is restoring the old racing cars and keeping them in, in condition to run? Yeah, keeping, restoring the race cars and the passenger cars. We have quite a collection of those as well. And just restoring them and keeping most of them running. How do you figure out, because there's not many of you that do this job, there's only perhaps you full time? There's three, three people all together. How do you find out how a 1915 car or a 1930 car actually works and runs? You weren't well, around to see it at the time. No, we have some books and, you know, there's really nothing's changed from 1900 till today. Everything's just been reinvented. There's a huge number of cars in here of every different sort. You must have a favourite car. What's your favourite car in here? Yeah, I do. <laughs> it's a Samson Special that's in the room behind us. Why is it favourite? It's a, v, it's a V16 Miller, just a cool supercharged car. And Frank Lockhart, the engine was used in his land speed record car in 1928. It's, and have you, have you driven it? No, it doesn't. It's one of our cars that doesn't run, one of the few that don't run. <laughs> Do you get to drive any of the cars? Well, the most exciting one was in 1986, it, before the start of the race. I got to drive AJ Foyt's 1961 winning car around the track in front of 400,000 people. And did you beat his original qualifying time? I car? was probably about 10 minutes longer than him. How often are the cars rebuilt? How do you get to prepare them all the time? Uh, most cars, like the Roadsters, they take a couple of days for each car to get them cleaned up and get them ready to run and then to usually a day afterwards to put them back so you put them back in storage again. And, and in, in the basement where you're doing all the restoration, which is a strictly off-limits area, we've tried for many years to get down there and have a look. Um, how, how many cars do you have down there now that you're working on? Oh, we have, in, we're just working on one car, working on a Fiat at the moment, and we have a Gullwing, 300 SL Gullwing Mercedes we've been working on as well. And you take these incredible cars all over the world? We go to Goodwood, we've been going there for the last 14 years. And then we take cars to Japan. For the first three IndyCar races, we went to Japan and took two cars each time and ran over there. And then we also send cars to Italy. Uh, we've had one in France. So we've shipped them around the world and run them as well. You take them yourself? Yeah, we go to, to run them. AJ, you're one of very few people in here doing it, possibly the only one, maybe one or two of you. Um, who's going to follow you? Who else is going to be able to learn how to manage these very, very old and specialised cars? I think they're all, all cars have all made the same components, they're just made differently. So I think in the years to come, we need to get new people a bit younger that are interested in older cars to come and learn 
what I know and I can pass on my knowledge to them. What are your plans ahead? Staying in the museum, looking after cars? That's my plan for the next you know, 15, 20 years maybe. You thoroughly enjoy it? Oh yes, it's been a great place. I've been here for 20 years now and it's been a great place to work. Here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the Indy 500 attracts a crowd of over 400,000 on race day. The place lives and breathes heritage and history. After the break, we'll be talking with Marcus Ambrose and Steve Millen on still Kiwis and characters in motorsport. Welcome back. We talk business now on Still Kiwis and Characters in Motorsport and the West Coast is the home base for Stillen, a leading company for aftermarket performance parts and car preparation. Kiwi Steve Millen created that company. Steve, we're standing here first of all in Stillen, but standing in front of two very important cars in your life, the IMSA car and the RT1. Give us a brief rundown of each one. Well, the RT1 was the car that we won the New Zealand Grand Prix and it was in Chardon colours back in 1980, Bob. And actually it was Chris Amon that it was at a point in my career when I wasn't very successful with running the Chevrons and Chris said, you know, if you change, he said, you change to a Rolt RT1. He says, that's, that's the secret. And we did, we went aboard an RT1 and it was. it was, it was a great car to race. So we raced it throughout Southeast Asia a lot. And so it was a pretty special car to us. And we brought it back recently, so it's back here restored. The other car you see here is the 300Z, and I had seven great years with Nissan um, running in the IMSA sports car series, and we won all sorts of races. We won Daytona and Sebring, Le Mans, and championships and so on. So it as well, while it tried to kill me, it's a famous car too. You started off driving, you've had a career driving. Do you still get a kick out of driving racing cars, especially these two? I still get a kick out of driving race cars, for sure, and particularly the new GTR, which we're going to run in Targa. But it's come full circle, Bob. Back in the old days, I would work from home and we'd build the car ourselves and I'd put the engine together myself and so on. And then when I came to America, I got into professional racing and all I did was just rock up carrying my helmet. Um, and so it was great to go for 13 years doing that as a professional driver. But now I'm back working on the cars, Bob. I'm working on Saturdays and Sundays and that preparing the cars. So we've come full circle. Well, when I first came to America, I came here really with nothing and I had to start again with my career. And so um, I had enough money to be able to get to racetracks, carry my helmet, try and get a ride, get and improve what I could do, and then build up to where I was a factory driver for Toyota for six years and then for Nissan for seven years. And, um, and everything was going great. Everything was really, really good. I was doing about 30 races a year, and then one day I thought, man, if this stops, for whatever reason, if I get hurt or whatever, I've got nothing to fall back on. So in 1986, 25 years ago, we started the company, so it was, there was something there for retirement after racing. California is a very, very tough place to do business with today, and a lot of people are moving out of California. But um, when I came here and we lived in California, I loved the place and still do. It's a, a, a nice place to live, a great place to live, but not very business friendly. The car parts business is a very competitive business, especially in America. Was it difficult for a Kiwi to break into that? It was. It was really a lot to learn in the early days, but, but right from the get-go we got into manufacturing because we thought that was going to be the, the, the crux of the business, was manufacturing our own parts. And, and over the years we, we invested in people and equipment and machinery and we've continued to manufacture all our own parts, which we're very proud of. Um, and you learn all the time. You never stop learning. Every day is a new day. What we do is it's a sales and marketing company first and foremost in selling our parts in specific niches um, with different models of cars around, around America and across the world. 
Um, and, and we're always developing new parts. We're making supercharger kits. We're making big brake AP racing kits. We're doing exhaust systems, which we manufacture here. We're, we're really taking a car and doing the aesthetics of the car, the handling of the car, the braking of the car, the engine performance. We're really doing all the options that one would want for his car. The market split up into many different niches like European cars, American muscle cars, um, and Japanese import cars and so on. We are in two of those markets. We're in the Japanese uh, import car market and also now the muscle car market with the Mustangs and the new Camaros. Um, it's probably a billion dollar a year business and, and we hold our own. We, we do well in the markets that we're in. The economy's had a, a negative effect I think on just about every company in America and, and a lot more so in some areas but we were down I think about 16-17% last year which by comparison to other companies is not bad and this year we're up. We're, we're on the way back up again. So, But it's because we've never stopped investing in R&D and new projects and we've continued to invest in that even when times were tough and I think it's done to pay off now for us. So how much temperature do you think, do you think we're going to reduce the charge by putting this in the here? Uh, probably about uh, maybe 70 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. <coughs> yeah. um, because we've got a, a nice thick core in the system, Yeah. Uh, multiple water passages and uh, dual So pass. how hot is it here? Uh, we're looking about uh, 180 Okay. And then it seals straight against the back of it. So what sort of finishes do you think we're doing this? Um, I think we should do a polished, um, to go with polished blowers as an option, but yeah. for the standard to do a black crinkle finish, powdered coat. I, I've known you a long time and I've known you've always been ambitious, so what's your ambition for still in now, for the future? Um, we, we're growing it by adding these new divisions this year, like with adding in the Camaros. The Camaro is a very, very popular car in America, and a lot of people are wanting to put superchargers and so on. Last year we had five Camaros here. We fitted superchargers to personal cars. So um, it's looking for new niches, and they're changing all the time because we're really in the fashion business, and, and, and we've got to follow the trends, follow the fashions. You are still a proud Kiwi. Do you visit home regularly? I do a lot. I love coming to New Zealand. It's, it's the best times. It's, it's those times that I look forward to coming to New Zealand, which keep me motivated through the year here. And I love coming down doing motorsport events too. I've got the Ford GT in New Zealand. Now I'm going to bring the GTR down and we're going to have a lot of fun in October. I spoke with Marcus Ambrose in an earlier show, but today I wanted to spend a bit more time with him to learn more about the racing side of NASCAR and the comparison to V8 supercar. Karting, Formula Ford, Formula 3 to V8 supercars, and now NASCAR. What was the biggest transition? You said some while ago in your book, I think published in 2004, that you'd basically given away the European scene and the US motor racing scene, yet here you are in NASCAR. What, what, what changed your mind? What well, it was just, uh, just, just a lot of luck, and uh, you know, I'd, I'd, run my, I'd run to the end of what I really wanted to do in Australia. I'd, I'd reached the point where I'd won championships. I was kind of the, the guy that was on top that everyone wanted to beat. And, uh, you know, I just didn't like that feeling of, of being the target, you know. So I was looking for something different. And I'd pushed away Europe because I'd been there and done that. I'd never really pushed away America so, so much, but there was nowhere I could really see myself uh, getting into. And just by luck and by chance, I met some guys at Ford Racing, Dan, Dan Davis and John Zemanski here in, in Ford Racing USA that were kind enough to uh, make some phone calls for me and, and open up a few doors and I jumped in and, uh, and the rest is history. It's not easy and uh, this is the hardest racing I've ever done in my life. It's just very fast, very intense. Uh, the level of competition is as high as you'll ever get. These guys, I mean, they can drive anything. They can drive road course, they can drive dirt ovals, they can drive high speed, Daytona, they can drive short tracks. Uh, there is nowhere to hide and it's the most expensive racing I've ever been a part of, the most uh, committed as a driver you have to be to, to make it in this game. And, that's why I'm here. I'm here to race against the best and challenge myself, but nothing really gets you ready for the ovals. Uh, it's a very, very intense and real world when you're out there because you know, you're running on the very edge, the tyres are sliding, smoking, you're running door to door, aerodynamics may, plays a major part in, in trying to make a successful pass, but you know what, uh, I'd do it all again it's just the same, it's been a great journey. Difficult for an Australian to enter? Yeah, to actually I mean, break into the whole scene good, good, good luck to anybody coming in because uh, <laughs> I've been fortunate enough to have you know, three or four years to really grow into where I am today and, and uh, I think other drivers may not have that chance and I've just been very fortunate that I've been given the time to grow and, and, and adapt into this category. You had a pretty good year last year, 2009. I mean, what do you have to get? What 
what um, skills have you had to hone to be able to drive at 220 miles an hour wheel to wheel with these guys? Well, you've got to forget about uh, setting up a race car like normal because normally I'm, I'm way over at the front and in the back of the car and, and everything's pretty much balanced left to right. Well, here, each tyre is independent of each other. So the left front might be quitting at the same time as the right rear is quitting. And so you, you, the, the, the front end's sliding up the racetrack at the same time that rear end's going to snap around. And so you've got to really feel the race car differently. You've got to pick each individual corner to make to get the feel right. Uh, and then you've got to get used to running a really, really loose race car. These things, they only go fast when they're slot sideways. And you've just got to keep the load off those front tyres because you just can't get around a two mile racetrack with the front tyres slipping because they're just going to overheat in three laps. So you've got to get used to running a really loose race car, which is uncomfortable at best at 200 mile an hour, but that's the way you got to run them. I want to win races and I want to contend for championship. Uh, I'm 33 now, so I'm definitely no spring chicken. And right now is go time. I've got to make sure I get myself in the best opportunity I can, 2011 and onwards. And, uh, you know, just, just let her eat. Just get out there and, and show everybody what i got or quit and go home. <laughs> New Zealand, world famous. <laughs> Marcus Ambrose, thank you very much. Thank There's you. a lot of people in New Zealand wishing you luck through all of this NESCAR. Thank well, you. Thank you very much. Well, that wraps up another week on Still Kiwis and Characters in Motorsport. And once again, it shows that Kiwis are heavily involved in motorsport in all its forms. But at heart, they're still all proud Kiwis. Before we go, here's a little look at next week's show. Tony Cotman tells us about a new era for the IndyCar series. Then we take another look around Kiwi Kev's backyard and Scott Dixon wraps things up in the IndyCar series. <laughs>